Hi, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us today. And welcome back to Vibes, the virtual behavioral economics seminar. Today, we're excited to have Michael Woodford from Columbia University. Mike will talk about optimally imprecise memory and biased forecasts, which is joint work with Rava Azeredo de Silveira and Yeji Sung. Before giving the floor to Mike, let me quickly remind you of the logistics. First of all, we ask you to please turn off your video in order to improve the quality of the connection for everybody. We will have 45 minutes of presentation followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. During the talk, questions will be limited to clarifying questions and you can ask them in the chat. Yeji, one of Mike's co-authors is online and might answer a few of the clarifying questions in the chat. During the Q&A, you will be able to ask your questions directly to Mike. That's all from me. Mike, thank you very much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, so, so thanks a lot uh, for allowing me to, um, uh, to address this group. I think it's a, it's a great innovation um, that, you've, uh, that, that you've organized this seminar. The, the topic of this research is understanding deviations from rational expectations in um, the forecasts that people have of future economic variables. There's a good bit of evidence uh, both from uh, surveys of, uh, of people's expectations and also from laboratory experiments where it's possible to observe forecasts in controlled environments and know exactly what information they have and what the statistical properties of the variables are that they're forecasting, that people's subjective forecasts don't um, entirely have the properties that correct Bayesian inference from the information that they've observed. Um, would imply, in particular, one often observes forecast errors that are predictable by variables that ought to be in the forecaster's information sets. Um, in particular, our work is motivated by evidence suggesting that subjective expectations often overreact to news about the variable that people are forecasting. And this theme of overreaction has been stressed in particular in a recent paper by uh, Bordalo, Genaioli, Ma, and Schleifer, uh, looking at survey evidence and a paper by uh, Hassan Afruzi and co-authors based on uh, laboratory experiments. So this idea of overreaction to recent trends in the data is an old one. A common approach uh, from several decades ago was to assume some kind of mechanical rule like the one on the slide here, where the difference between your forecast of the future and the current value of the variable would be proportional to a recent change in the variable. So so-called extrapolative expectations. A standard objection to that kind of mechanical approach was that it would imply that if you have stationary fluctuations in the data, this would imply systematic biases in forecasts that people ought to, you might think, ought to be able to eventually notice and therefore not continue the forecast uh, in that same biased way. A more sophisticated proposal um, in the last decade by uh, David Labson and co-authors uh, proposed an idea they called natural expectations which was the idea that people forecast using an autoregressive model of the process they're forecasting. And with the coefficients of the autoregressive model that they use to form their forecasts being in fact the coefficients that best fit the stationary dynamics of the process itself. So this is a hypothesis under which if the actual process is a low order autoregression, people should learn to forecast it perfectly. But if the true process is something more complicated than that, then the fact that people only consider forecasting models with a finite number of legs can lead to systematic biases in their forecasts. And they show that under some circumstances, this can imply over extrapolation of recent trends of a kind that seems to go on. But I think there are important questions about how satisfactory that is as an answer. Um, one question about it is, even if you suppose that forecasts have to be based on some smaller number of statistics, not on the complete data record, why would it have to be just the last K observations instead of something like moving averages of the past data? 
in the example that uh, Fuster, Abair, and Leibson um, have in the paper that I cite, um, they have an example where the systematic overextrapolation of recent trends occurs, but it depends on the actual data generating process being a very long moving average. And being able to use moving averages to forecast would probably eliminate a lot of the bias. Another question about that proposal is that it implies that this problem should exist only if the true dynamics aren't well described by some low order autoregressive process. In the lab experiments that I mentioned, um, in the Afruzi et al. paper, the true dynamics are a simple first order autoregressive process. So if people use even one lag in the forecasting rules that they consider, under the natural expectations hypothesis, they should learn to perfectly forecast uh, this process. Instead, the systematic overreaction uh, is observed. So we propose a model of biases in forecasts where people's forecasts are assumed to be optimal um, subject to a constraint that these forecasts have to be based on an imprecise memory of the past data that have occurred. We're going to allow the response rule to the imprecise memory to be an optimal one, one that maximizes expected utility or minimizes a loss function. Um, we have no a priori restriction on how sophisticated the decision rules might be subject to their having to be based on this imperfect uh, memory. Furthermore, our assumptions about the imperfection in memory, we allow the structure of memory to be optimized itself, optimized to make these forecasts as accurate as possible, subject only to a complexity constraint on, uh, on how informative the memory can be. So apart from this complexity constraint, there's gonna be no a priori assumption about what data people might be able to remember and therefore base their forecasts on. In adopting this idea that the memory structure is optimized subject to this flexible constraint on how complex it can be, our theory is in the spirit of Chris Sims's theory of rational inattention. The crucial difference is that the way Sims formulates his idea of rational inattention, he assumes a limit on how precisely people can be aware of new observations of things happening in the world but he allows his decision maker to have a perfect memory of everything that's ever happened in their head. So any fuzzy observations of the world they've ever made in the past, they can still perfectly recall. Instead, we're not going to assume any limit on the precision of new observations of things happening right now, but instead the limit is on the precision of your memory of things that you have known in the past. So the class of decision problems we consider are ones where the external world is evolving according to this first order autoregressive process written uh, at the top of the slide. There are random innovations in this process drawn from a Gaussian distribution. The task of the decision maker is to produce some vector of forecasts, ZT. Their forecasts of future realizations, uh, Z tilde T, these Z tilde T's that they're trying to forecast are some uh, linear combinations of future realizations of the Y process. So this is a flexible setup that may involve making forecasts of the Y series at different horizons in the future. And it could include things like forming an estimate of your permanent income that would be some uh, discounted sum of future realizations uh, of this process that has to be forecasted. We're going to assume that this vector of forecast Z is chosen to minimize uh, the expected value, expected discounted value of a quadratic loss function of the quadratic function of the discrepancies between Z and the eventually realized value Z tilde. Uh, so again, the degree to which the decision maker cares about different types of errors, get errors in different components of this vector Z, we're going to be relatively flexible about. To simplify the discussion, we're going to further assume that the decision rule uh, can be optimized for a particular coefficient of serial correlation of the process Y and a particular variance of the innovations in the process Y. The thing that we're going to assume can't be known, and so the decision process 
can't be optimized for that is what the mean is of that process, the mu in the previous slide. We're going to assume that the mu is drawn from some prior distribution and we can optimize the decision rule for means drawn from that prior. Uh, the prior is assumed to be uh, some Gaussian distribution. So if there were no memory limitations in this setup where we assume the decision rule can't already know what the mean of the process is, it should be possible eventually to learn the value of this unknown mean to arbitrary precision. And so at least in the long run, an optimal decision rule should coincide exactly with rational expectations forecasts. That's not going to happen though in our model uh, because of the limits on memory. Okay, so, uh, but in the class of problems that I've described, the minimum achievable value of this quadratic loss function will be some multiple of the discounted sum of mean squared errors in the optimal estimate of this unknown mean mu, conditioning on um, the information in um, the noisy cognitive state of the decision maker. So we can equivalently formulate our decision problem as one of designing a memory process that minimizes this discounted sum of mean squared errors in your subjective estimate of what the mean of the process is. The crucial thing, of course, about the setup is what we assume are the limitations on memory. So we're going to allow relatively flexible specification of that. We're going to suppose the memory at each point in time can be summarized by some vector, m sub t, but that vector can be of arbitrary length. The decisions made in period T will then have to be some function of a cognitive state ST that consists of all the elements of that vector and of YT, the current observation. We'll assume no problem observing the current value of YT, but making your actions be a function of past values of YT will depend on memory providing information about those past values. We um, assume that this memory state evolves according to a linear law of motion that makes the vector m carried into period t plus one some linear function of the elements of the cognitive state st in period t with a matrix lambda uh, mapping that vector st into a vector of values mt plus one and adding a vector of Gaussian uh, random noise to that vector. Uh, let what the dimension of the mt plus one is can be arbitrary. The elements of this matrix lambda can be arbitrary. The variance covariance matrix of that vector of Gaussian noise uh, can be arbitrary. So we're allowing a relatively flexible specification of what the noisy memory is like. I think I'll skip that example. The crucial thing then is our limit on how informative memory can be. The thing we do assume a limit on is the Shannon mutual information between this memory state mt plus one and the previous period's cognitive state that it's providing information about. So this is a flexible way of uh, measuring how informative memory is about the past. We're going to assume a limit on that. that there's some cost of having a higher value of this mutual information that is at least weakly increasing um, in the mutual information. Using that measure of complexity, we're following Sims's uh, theory of rational intention. The results in the paper are for two polar assumptions about this cost function. One is that the cost is zero up to some finite upper bound on the mutual information, but that you can't have uh, mutual information higher than this finite I bar. The other case is a cost function that's linear in the mutual information for some multiplicative factor theta. So now with this cost function, we can formulate our problem as one of choosing a memory structure in each period so as to minimize this uh, discounted loss function, which has in each period an alpha times the mean squared error of estimating mu in that period and the cost of the memory um, that's uh, used in that period. And so minimizing now this objective that takes into account on the one hand, the accuracy of your estimates of uh, this unknown state variable, and on the other hand, minimizes the uh, cost of operating the memory is what we're interested in. 
So we can say some general things about what um, a memory structure in this flexible class is going to have to be like. Because of the linear Gaussian setup, at each point in time, conditioning on this memory state, this vector mt, there'll be a posterior distribution over what the unknown mean is and over all the past realizations of the time series. That posterior will be always a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So we can completely identify it by its first and second moments. Um, we're particularly interested in some particular first and second moments of that posterior. This little m bar is the posterior means for two variables in this vector xt, the posterior mean for mu and the posterior mean for the realization of the variable in the previous period. Uh, sigma t, this capital sigma, is the variance covariance matrix for that particular part of the posterior. Uh, those things are crucial. The sigma t is only going to depend on time. It'll be the same uh, in every memory state at a given point in time. The m bar sub t will be a random vector. It'll be a linear function of the big vector uh, specifying the complete memory state. After another observation of the time series yt is observed, we'll have a new posterior. That posterior will also be multivariate Gaussian. And uh, we're particularly interested in uh, the first and second moments for the estimate of the unknown mean mu, now conditioning on this cognitive state that includes both the memory carried into period p and the new observation of the variable yt in period t. Mu hat t is the mean of that posterior. Sigma hat squared t is the variance of that posterior. And so these are two crucial state variables. The mu hat is going to be the subjective estimate of mu that will determine the forecasts. The sigma hat squared um, is the degree of uncertainty about mu. That'll determine the mean squared error um, of those forecasts. And it's important to note that the mu hat is going to evolve. It'll be a linear function of m bar t, which was part of those first moments of the memory state carried into period t, and the observation yt. We can use a common filter formula to write how mu hat depends on those two things. This gamma 1 in the formula, the so-called common gain, is an important variable in our model. What that gamma 1 is telling us is how sensitive estimates of mu, how sensitive the mu hat is to the current realization of the variable y. That's going to be important for um, explaining the degree of overreaction in people's forecasts to news about the variable y. The sigma hat squared t will be a function just of the matrix uh, capital sigma at, period, at time t, and it'll again just be a function of time. Okay, so the main result we get in the paper characterizing the nature of the optimal memory structure in this kind of setup is that the optimal memory structure, we've allowed it to be a vector of arbitrary length. Um, we don't need to ever have more than one variable um, in it in the optimal memory structure. So we can summarize the optimal memory structure by a single variable. M tilde is now a scalar at time t plus one, which is a particular linear combination of just two elements of the cognitive state in period t. This S bar t is the reduced cognitive state consisting of the estimate at t of what the unknown mu is and the observation at t of the current valuable, vari value of the variable y t. Uh, what this formula says is that there's a selection vector v prime that takes a particular linear combination of those two things and then multiplies it um, by lambda, which is a scalar measuring the sensitivity of memory next period to the cognitive state in period T. There's a Gaussian random noise term then added to the memory, um, the variance of which depends on this lambda. So the VT is normalized so that the variance of V prime S bar is one. We use that normalization. So the V is just telling us which linear combination you store a noisy record of. In memory, the lambda measures the sensitivity of memory to the previous period's cognitive state. And then we have two parameters to describe memory each period. One is the direction of the vector v, 
and then the other is this sensitivity parameter lambda. Okay, so then we want to choose the lambda and the direction of v each period to specify memory. The mutual information cost is simple to write in terms of those parameters because mutual information is just a function of this lambda. Uh, it's the function written on the slide here, an increasing function of lambda that becomes unboundedly large as lambda approaches one. So lambda has to be between zero and one. Uh, the cost of lambda equals zero, which will be a perfectly uninformative memory is zero. The cost is increasing in lambda and becomes unbounded as lambda approaches one. Given the choice of lambda and the vector v in each period, um, we have a solution from the model for what the degree of uncertainty about mu will be in the following period as a function of the degree of uncertainty in period t and the memory structure chosen in period t. So we can characterize that function f at the bottom of the slide. We have an analytical solution for it in the paper, which I won't, uh, won't present, but we can solve for that function. We can now give a recursive formulation to our optimal memory structure problem. We'll define a value function at some time t as the minimum achievable value of the terms in our objective function from period t onward as a function of the memory structure chosen in periods prior to t, we show that this uh, value function, v sub t, is a time invariant function of the degree of uncertainty in period t about mu. So the only thing that matters about memory prior to period t is what it implies the sigma hat squared is in period t. Given that, we can solve for what the minimum possible continuation objective is from period t onwards. And now we can write a Bellman equation that that value function v of sigma hat squared has to satisfy. And this says that the v of sigma hat squared in period t is equal to the sum of three terms on the right side. The first term is alpha times the mean squared error. That just depends on the sigma hat squared t. And the other two terms are the minimum achievable values of two terms. The first one is the cost of the mutual information of the memory used in period T. And the second is the discount factor beta times the continuation value from period T plus one onward, which will depend on the sigma hat squared for period T plus one, which is a known function of sigma hat squared T and the choice of the memory structure in period T. So given that uh, function little f that defines the dynamics of uncertainty, we can define this Bellman equation and that describes the optimization problem we have to solve for the optimal memory structure each period. So if we had um, lambda bar, I'm gonna consider now the case where there's a fixed upper bound on the lambda, um, which corresponds to, I should have said, I guess I don't have that, I've skipped the slide, but. Um, should have said that if we have the fixed upper bound on mutual information, we can translate that into a fixed upper bound on the value of this lambda. And so we can consider the problem of choosing the optimal memory structure with a given upper bound on lambda. If the upper bound um, allowed lambda to be equal to one, that would be the case of perfect memory. In that case, we know what Bayesian updated implies would imply that the precision of the estimate of mu should grow linearly with the number of observations according to the formula on the slide here. That implies the uncertainty about mu falls monotonically over time. It'll approach zero as time becomes uh, large enough. And you would get the rational expectations then in the long run. If instead we have a finite upper bound on mutual information, that implies a value less than one, which is the upper bound on lambda, this lambda bar upper bound, then we can show instead it'll be optimal to set lambda t equal to lambda bar to have memory be as sensitive to the previous cognitive state as possible. But with that lambda less than one, Posterior uncertainty will fall with experience, but remain bounded away from zero forever. And how far it's bounded away from zero will depend on how much below one this bound lambda bar 
So I'm going to show you some uh, illustrations of numerical results from our optimization problem. It's going to be convenient to present the numerical results in terms of rescaled variables, where we scale our variables uh, relative to sigma squared y, the variance of the fluctuations in this external state, because the absolute size of the fluctuations doesn't matter to anything. So we're going to rescale our prior uncertainty about mu, uh, that prior uncertainty capital omega, scale it relative to sigma squared y, and so this K ratio will be our dimensionless way of parameterizing the amount of prior uncertainty. And we're going to measure posterior uncertainty about mu by this state variable eta sub t, the ratio of that sigma squared t uh, scaled by sigma squared y. And uh, we can now trace the dynamics of this with an optimal memory structure. Um, in the numerical examples, I'm going to show you beta, the discount factor in the objective function is 0 0.99. Um, here in the slides, I'll show numerical examples where k, the measure of prior uncertainty, is equal to 1. So the prior uncertainty about the mean is the same size as the, fluctuate, the stationary variance of the fluctuations in the state variable. And um, so here are some examples of numerical solutions for how this measure of uncertainty about the mean mu will change over time as the decision maker gains more experience, observes more and more realizations of why the dashed purple line labeled lambda bar equals 1.0, that's the case of perfect memory. No constraint on memory, that's standard Bayesian updating. You see the degree of uncertainty starts at the level of prior uncertainty, which is this eta equal to 0.5, given that I assume k was equal to 1. And um, this scaled uncertainty measure falls pretty rapidly. The first several observations uh, bring that uncertainty measure down from 0.5 down to the order of 0.1, and it keeps falling and falling and asymptotically approaches zero. The asymptotic values of each of these series are shown in the right panel. Those colored dots are where all of those paths converge to as the number of observations goes to infinity. So the purple dot is at zero. If lambda bar is less than one, we have uh, uncertainty falling with additional observations, but it asymptotes at some positive level of uncertainty. And you go over to the right, you see what it asymptotes to in each case. The lower the lambda bar is, um, the sooner uh, the level of uncertainty asymptotes, and the higher the level of remaining uncertainty that you have, no matter how many observations the decision maker makes. So that's our first result, that uncertainty about mu will not disappear in the long run with this constraint on the precision of memory. This slide shows some other things about the nature of the state of knowledge of the decision maker in the long run as the number of observations becomes large. So that eta sub infinity in the upper left is this limit point of the scaled uncertainty measure that I was showing you on the previous slide. On the previous slide, the degree of serial correlation of the process uh, y was rho equals zero. Here we show how that limiting value varies for different values of rho between zero and one and several different values of lambda bar. You see uh, that in each case, the long run level of uncertainty is well above zero. Uh, the, the lower lambda bar is, the higher that long run level of uncertainty is. Over in the right, V sub infinity is telling the direction of the selection vector V in the optimal memory structure. Here as a function of the degree of serial correlation of the underlying process that's being forecasted and for different values of lambda bar. The V infinity plotted here is the relative weight on the second component, uh, the relative weight on the previous observation of Y, normalizing the weight on the estimate of mu to be one. This uh, quantity is zero when rho is zero. That says you just store a noisy estimate of uh, your previous subjective estimate of mu. You don't store any information about the previous observation of y. As the degree of serial correlation becomes larger, this uh, V infinity becomes a negative quantity, meaning you store some linear combination of your estimate of mu and your observation of y with opposite signs on those two components. 
and the importance of the weight on the previous observation of y becomes bigger and bigger as the zero correlation gets greater. Gamma one in the lower left-hand panel was that Kalman gain coefficient, which as I pointed out, indicates how much even in the long run, the subjective estimate of mu is changed by the current observation of y. In the rational expectations, that thing should be zero. So if lambda bar were equal to one, that would converge to zero in the long run. Here we see it remains positive uh, and non-trivial in the long run for these values of lambda bar less than one. Rho sub m in the lower right panel is a measure of the degree of intrinsic persistence of the memory state. So this is indicating the extent to which random variation in the memory state, either from past observations or from past noise in the memory process, to what extent uh, a high value of the memory state is associated with a continuing high value of the memory state in later periods. We see this rho sub m is positive um, again uh, for all of the different uh, all of the different cases. So there's a tendency of the memory state to have intrinsic persistence. Uh, an implication then of our solution is that in the long run, the dynamics of the memory state and the true process Y co-evolve according to a linear Gaussian process that can be described as um, a two-dimensional vector of this kind, uh, stacking M tilde and Y together in a first order vector autoregressive system with two Gaussian error terms over at the right hand side, the two random processes that are perturbing the evolution of these two variables that evolve together. So we have a stationary process now for the coevolution of the true state Y and this subjective memory state M tilde. An implication of this is that this belief state M tilde is going to be perpetually fluctuating. Um, this is essentially going to be telling us about variations in the estimate, the subjective estimate of the mu, and those subjective estimates are going to be perpetually fluctuating around their mean value rather than converging to some single point belief that eventually no longer changes. And that's then going to determine the nature of the fluctuating biases in forecasts. So what will the forecasts of the decision maker be like if they have to use this kind of imperfect memory? If they had rational expectations, the forecast would be given by this uh, formula at the top of the slide, the true conditional expectation of yt plus h, of what y will be h periods in the future will be a linear combination of the mu that you would know if you have rational expectations and the current yt. The relative weights on those two things are uh, one minus rho to the m and rho to the m where rho is the serial correlation coefficient of the process. In our setup with forecasts having to be based on imperfect memory, the forecast h periods in ahead, this thing represent, written as y hat t plus h, slash t means uh, at time t, that subjective forecast will also be a weighted average of the optimal subjective estimate of mu and of the value yt that is observed at time t with the same relative weights. It's just that the subjective estimate of mu has to be used instead of the true value. So the biases in forecasts are going to come about because of this use of the subjective estimate of mu rather than the true value of mu. We've seen that an innovation in Y is going to increase the subjective estimate mu hat. That was the common gain coefficient that was positive. That means a positive innovation in Y raises this subjective estimate of mu. Because of that, the effect on the forecast of YT plus H will be bigger than in under rational expectations. So under rational expectations up at the top of the slide, you see an innovation in YT should affect the forecast of yt plus h with a coefficient rho to the m. Down at the bottom, you see it's going to affect it with a coefficient of rho to the m plus one minus rho to the m times the effect on this estimate of mu. The effect on the estimate of mu is the common gain coefficient gamma one. So instead of rho to the m, it's gonna be rho to the m plus one minus rho to the m times gamma one. Gamma one is positive. That's going to give us our overreaction. Um, 
This is showing you impulse responses to a positive innovation in the variable Y, uh, impulse responses of the subjective estimate of mu um, in our parameterized model um, for different values of the lambda bar, which corresponds to different upper bounds on um, how informative memory can be. Lambda bar equals one is again the perfect memory case. That's the dashed purple line at the bottom of the slide. That's the case where people have rational expectations in the long run and you see zero response. When Y is unexpectedly high, that doesn't change your estimate of mu at all because you've learned the true value of mu. So there's no response immediately or later. Instead, when lambda bar is less than one, what you see is this thing jumps up when there's a positive innovation at time zero in the process Y. It jumps up by more the lower the Y lambda bar is. So the tighter the constraint on memory, the larger the jump up in the subjective estimate of mu when you have an unexpectedly positive realization of Y. We also see that this perturbation of the subjective estimate of mu is somewhat persistent. It remains higher for a while later. It's more persistent though, the bigger the lambda bar is. So when lambda bar is relatively close to one, the increase in the subjective estimate of mu is not as big, but it's very persistent. When lambda bar is much smaller, the increase in the subjective estimate of mu is much bigger, but it's not as persistent. It decays back to zero relatively quickly. This is then the corresponding effect on the subjective forecast of Y itself in the future. What we're plotting here is the subjective forecast of Y at T plus one, the forecast at time T for each of several periods T. And we're asking how those one period ahead forecasts are changed on average by an unexpectedly positive realization of the process Y at time zero. Here, the true serial correlation is 0.4. So under rational expectations, a high value of Y should increase your forecast of Y in the future. It should increase it by 0.4 times the current realization of Y. That's why the dashed purple line, which is rational expectations, uh, jumps up to 0.4 at time zero, the time of the innovation. And then it gradually decays back to zero at the rate that the rational expectations forecast would decay back to zero. The other colored lines show how the forecast is affected by this unexpected positive realization of Y at time zero. And you see overreaction. It would go up by 0.4. If you had rational expectations, it goes up by more than 0.4 when lambda bar is less than one. The smaller the lambda bar is, meaning the tighter the memory constraint, the greater the extent of this overreaction. On the other hand, the overreaction is more persistent when lambda bar is only a little less than one. When lambda bar is smaller, there's a bigger initial overreaction, but it's not as persistent. What does this have to do with the kinds of measures of overreaction of people's expectations that have been documented in the literature? I want to talk about some of the uh, measures that have been used. Um, in particular, I want to talk about the lab experiment uh, of Afruzi and co-authors. They have subjects observing successive realizations of a stationary first order autoregressive process, the same kind of process as the YT process in the theoretical model that I've just gone through. And they have, after each new observation of Y, the subjects have to forecast future values of Y at different horizons H. And they elicit those forecasts, then they have them see another realization, make forecasts again, and so on. The measure of overreaction that they emphasize is to regress the subjective forecast for the H periods ahead outcome on the current realization. So this rho subjective sub H is the regression coefficient if you regress the H period ahead forecast on the current uh, realization of Y. And they compare those subjective regression coefficients to what the rational expectations regression coefficient, the rho sub h should be. What they find is the subjective regression coefficients are bigger than what they would be under rational expectations. And so that's what they uh, call overreaction. The degree to which the subjective regression coefficient is bigger is larger 
the less persistent the underlying process is, and that degree of overreaction goes to zero as the underlying process approaches a random walk. Uh, furthermore, the re relationship between this rho subjective and the rational expectations regression coefficient is approximately the same regardless of the forecast horizon. Uh, so this is showing you what they find uh, on the vertical axis is the regression coefficient using the experimental subject subjective forecast. Horizontal axis is the rational expectations regression coefficient. The different types of dots and x's are forecasts different distances into the future. You see all those points are above the diagonal. That's always overreaction. Uh, they are above the diagonal to the greatest extent when the rational expectations coefficient is not too big, which is the case where the process is not, uh, not very serially correlated. That's over to the left of the slide. You also see that all those points look kind of like they're falling on a single curve or a single line. Here's the prediction of our theoretical model. If I pick the k parameter, parameterizing um, uncertainty, prior uncertainty about what mu is, and lambda bar, this measure of the limit on the precision of memory to be 0.3. Uh, it predicts um, curves given by those three different colors um, shown by the colored lines here. Those three lines are almost on top of each other. Uh, they're all above the diagonal. They are most above the diagonal over to the left. They approach the diagonal as uh, the true degree of serial correlation approaches one, and they pretty well fit all of the uh, subjective regression coefficients uh, from the experimental data. Another uh, way of measuring overreaction that Bordalo and co-authors emphasize in their work using uh, survey expectations of professional forecasters, what they do is regress the error in an individual forecaster's forecast of some variable H periods later on the recent revision of that forecaster's forecasts. So the forecaster's forecast for period T plus H, they compare their forecast at time T and their forecast at an earlier time T minus one and ask how that change in their forecast forecast the degree to which the forecast will turn out to be wrong. If the forecasters have rational expectations, there should be no forecastability of the forecast error by anything that the forecaster themselves know at time t. So this regression coefficient should be zero. What they show is that this coefficient is often negative. And they call that evidence for overreaction, the finding that this regression coefficient d uh, for many macroeconomic and financial time series is negative. They also find that this overreaction in the sense of a negative regression coefficient is stronger in the case of less persistent time series. So this is a figure from the Afruzi et al. paper. Um, on the vertical axis, we're plotting that regression coefficient B for different macro and financial time series. The dots are different time series. On the horizontal axis is a measure of the autocorrelation of the time series that's being forecasted. So what you find is B um, being characteristically negative, except in the case of the very persistent uh, processes, and most negative for the least persistent of these processes. So that's the characteristic prediction of uh, overreaction or finding of overreaction, and it's found uh, mainly just with not too correlated underlying processes. This is the prediction of our model for what that regression coefficient B should be like for different degrees of serial correlation of the underlying process. Here, we're parameterizing the model the same way as on the previous slide. So we're using the parameters that fit the experimental data in the Afruzi et al. study, k equals one, lambda bar equals 0.3, asking what this regression coefficient B would be predicted to be, the answer is it should be negative when rho is uh, below 0.5. It should be around zero for higher values of rho. Um, that's roughly similar to what was being found uh, with the actual uh, survey expectations. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll skip these other comments.
um, and um, just say that um, what we find is that this characteristic pattern of overreaction can reflect optimal decision making if we suppose that forecasts have to be based on an imprecise memory of what's been observed up to that point, rather than being able to be based on a precise record of previous observations. We can furthermore explain the pattern of overreaction under a hypothesis that memory is imperfect, but imperfect in a way that's efficient given the cost of greater precision, uh, as in rational retention models. This hypothesis, we furthermore argue, is consistent with a number of aspects that have been observed of people's forecasts, both in laboratory experiments and surveys of economic forecasters. Um, we think then this, um, this mechanism might be an important element in explaining ways that macroeconomic and financial dynamics in the world are different from the ones predicted by rational expectations equilibrium models. There have been a lot of puzzles about the ability of rational expectations models to fit fluctuations in macroeconomic and financial time series. And we think this kind of systematic error in expectation formation may be the key to a lot of those puzzles. Excellent. Thank you so much for this very interesting talk. Uh, we're going to start the Q&A section now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand or you can directly unmute yourself and, and ask the question directly to, to Michael. Can I, can I ask a question uh, about the solution concept? First of all, great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I must have missed it, maybe, or maybe you can clarify. So when you have limited memory models, there is an issue how, you know, what is the right solution concept? And is there a, a, a sort of commitment power of the player making a decision vis-a-vis -vis his or her own selves in the future? Um, what, what, is, uh, what, what is here in the model, if you, if you could say that? So, so there, there is no, um, no assumed commitment of, of anything about the future. Of course, there's no strategic uh, uh, elements in this, but I mean, the, I, I described the way we solve for the optimal memory structure. It's in fact in that recursive way. So in other words, in each period, the memory structure that's being chosen is the one that solved that problem in the Bellman equation, which is taking as given the value of a certain degree of uncertainty in the next period. And so that's, that value function would represent what you would expect about what your future self will be able to do with that memory. That's being taken as given in optimizing the memory structure chosen in each period T. So there's not any element about committing um, what your future self is going to do with the memory. It's taking as given a value function, which is your estimate of what, but what do you, of your future self will be given the memory. And that's in fact then um, correct in the sense that it's a fixed point of that Bellman equation, the, the value function that you're using to solve. Um, if, solve if you it. try to solve that once and for all, would the solution be the same you think? Sorry to press. I, 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 I believe that it is. I don't, I don't think that there's okay. any of wanting to commit to a given time. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any questions? Oh, there is a question from the chat. Yes. So Nikita Kotsensko asks, I don't have access to resent. Um, I understand why people in a lab would not have perfect memory but it seems strange for professional forecasters. Can I think about your model as one in which all the observations become outdated and less relevant? For example, if mu is drifting slowly over time? You might interpret it that way. I, I think the, the thing that we think is most likely is that also the professional forecasters aren't really using um, a mechanical forecasting rule. In other words, they haven't just programmed their computer to produce a forecast, that their sense of judgment is also an important um, input into the forecast and that that's formed in a more subjective way, taking into account, of course, a lot of data, that they're, they're following a lot of data, but their sense of 
how they're going to shade their forecasts based on all the data they've seen is in fact done in a subjective way and we think could be subject to these biases in the way um, the things they've seen are being intuitively summarized. So it's true that in the problem that we actually set up and solved the math for, you might say, well, if you're, you know, if you're a professional, if you've taken classes in learning how to do forecasting, you should realize you could program your computer to do the, the correct uh, Bayesian forecasts for this process and you see the number each period and you type it in and you let the program do the Bayesian thing for you. And um, you know, why don't you just keep doing that? Why don't you just write the program the right way and every time you get a new observation, type it in correctly, make sure you type it correctly and, uh, and trust your program. And in the simple world of the model, of course, that would be fine. In the actual world, uh, the things that are happening are more complex. The forecasters believe that they have you know, observed or heard about all kinds of things that are to some extent relative, relevant for improving their forecast. And so they're in fact doing a more intuitive thing. They're not willing to just trust some simple formula to be the best forecast they can produce. But we think that that then introduces the possibility of, of, of bias of this kind that we're modeling. So in experiments, you often see that people look back three periods um, to do forecasts and they, they typically don't, don't go, go very much into the future. So would you then be able to estimate and say this is very far away from the optimal? Is that within your scope or is it completely off? Well, I mean, we can ask what according to this optimized memory structure, to what extent it would be sensitive to observations at different distances in the past. And, and that's in the paper. I didn't have time to talk about it. Um, but although I did show you something that was the key to it, which was this, um, back to this formula, this thing. So this thing says that the M tilde that people's forecasts are being based on, it's always gonna be based on the current observation Y and M tilde as a summary of the past. And this describes how the M tilde will evolve as a function of uh, the Ys. And you can take this formula and write it, write the M tilde as an expansion of how it depends on why the period before, the period before that, the period before that, and so on, and, um, and see to what extent the M tilde should be sensitive to Ys at different distances in the past. And what it implies is that the most recent Ys have the biggest weights in their influence on M tilde and hence in their influence on subjective forecasts. And so what this does imply is that the previous periods uh, y isn't going to affect your forecast quite as much as the current one. The period before that will affect it less than one period ago. Three periods ago will have a smaller effect than two periods ago. Four periods ago will have an even smaller effect than that, and so on. And uh, so you could say, according to this theory, uh, at what rate the, uh, the sensitivity to things you've observed in the past should be dying out. Now, it doesn't imply that it dies out exactly after three. I mean, it's a formula that would imply that in this optimal structure, there's a small dependence on four periods earlier and five periods earlier, but those things are dying out relatively quickly. So, but, but then what is the relationship to reinforcement? Where, where you basically take the entire past and you just wait the previous periods a little bit more. Uh, well, it's, it's very similar. So we, we point out that this formula, I mean, it implies that the, we can derive a formula for say the mu hat, the subjective estimate of the mean as a function of current and lagged Ys. And it's a lot like so-called constant gain learning models where your estimate is a moving average of past Ys uh, with exponentially declining weights on those past observations. It's a little more complicated than that because the way the current Y enters the formula and the past Ys are a little different, um, but it's only slightly more complicated than that kind of exponentially weighted moving average with, the thing is we didn't assume it, 
we derive that as an implication of the optimal memory structure subject to this mutual information constraint. And we can derive how the smoothing parameter in that exponentially weighted moving average will be a function of parameters of the model, how it'll depend on the degree of persistence of the process and how it depends on the limit um, on the complexity of memory. So maybe a last question, quick question. How many parameters do you have? So, I mean, lambda, mu, and uh, I don't know. Well, the, the mu is a, something that's assumed to be true about the world. So in terms of the parameter of the decision problem, there's this beta, the degree to which you discount um, errors in your future decisions relative to errors in your current decision. Uh, so there's the beta that matters. Then in terms of the limits on memory precision, there is this, um, say it's the lambda bar, if we just have an upper bound on uh, memory. So there's the lambda bar, there's the discount factor, then there's the degree of prior uncertainty. That was the thing that ended up being called capital K. So we end up with a model with the capital K and the lambda bar being the two parameters that relate to uh, the errors in subjective forecasts. So you might have too many parameters in comparison to reinforcement. Well, if we just assume an exponentially weighted moving average and there's just the exponential weight, right, that would be a, that would be a single parameter. That's right. Okay. Thank you. I was told I should just unmute myself and ask. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, great. So first, first of all, thanks for the thanks for the answer. Um, just to clarify, uh, if you let, if instead of the memory limit, you let mu drift, so that uncertainty about it doesn't disappear, do you get similar predictions? Um. I believe that the answer is yes, in the sense that you would have forecasts that would be a function of past, uh, past observations with weights that would be declining in the past. And that's what we show, um, and that's what we show comes out of this. Um, a feature of our setup is that it justifies that kind of conclusion in a case where you don't have to have that actual drift, and in particular, the degree to which the weights on past observations are declining doesn't have to be tied um, to the amount of the drift. And I think there is, um, um, you know, there, there is reason to believe that this occurs, that in other words, that people act as if they're forming forecasts uh, with the sensitivity of their forecast to past observations dying out faster than would be justified by the actual degree of drift in, um, in the parameters of the processes that... Um, uh, All right, thank you. Excellent, it's five. So it's a good moment to stop. Thank you, Michael, for a very interesting talk. Thank you, Yeji. Thank you very much. Being active in the chat. Thank you, uh, all the participants for tuning in and, and all the questions. Uh, before we leave, I'd like to remind you that in, in two weeks from now, we'll have the last uh, webinar of the year, the last web of the year, uh, in which Boton Kosegi will, will present. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you all. Thank you, and thank you, Yeji, for helping with the questions.